Hello, everyone. My name is Chow Pham, and I work at the Health Sciences Center as an emergency physician in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I am the ultrasound director for the Department of Emergency Medicine. Being a champion for performance psychology and advocate for physician wellness, I coordinate the high performance physician and mentorship programs for our department. However, of all my roles, what grounds me first and foremost are my two cherished roles of wife and mom. So for day one of CAPE's Emergency Medicine Wellness Week, this podcast will focus on the path to better personal recovery. Optimizing personal recovery can be a challenge at the best of times for emergency physicians, let alone after nearly two years of living and performing in a pandemic and all the challenges that it continues to bring. In this talk, you will hear some ideas on how to improve personal recovery within these challenging times. I am thrilled to introduce you to a wonderful friend of mine, Dr. Jason Brooks, who is truly one of the best in the field of performance psychology. Over the last 20 years as a mental performance coach, Jason has collaborated with outstanding performers in diverse fields from elite athletes, musicians, physicians, and tactical law enforcement officers to business leaders and entrepreneurs. Through these experiences, Jason has observed how these individuals develop unique sets of beliefs and practices that equip them to thrive in demanding performance settings and that contribute towards them living their best life. He continues to share and expand on these ideas through his coaching practices and also through the many talks and seminars that he conducts across North America. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Well, thank you so much, Chow. It's an honor to be here with you all today. And, and, you know, this is a challenging topic, as you alluded to in your notes. I mean, at the best of times in your field, let alone, you know, going through the pandemic and some of the challenges that that still presents to us. Um, and I'm coming at this talk with a lot of compassion as a result of that for how difficult this can be. Um, having said that, I think there are some ideas that we can share with everybody here today uh, to help us embed better recovery into our lives and into our days, uh, in spite of how difficult at times it can feel that that uh, possibility is for us. Um, and I don't think it's going to be about tips and tricks per se. That would be somewhat insulting if this was about, uh, you know, getting so much sleep or exercise or what have you. And that's part of recovery. Um, but to me, the more important issues is to figure out what is it that we need to overcome and what is it that we need to have in place such that the prospects of some semblance of sustainable personal recovery efforts are doable. So we're going to focus on those primary things first and foremost. What are the barriers to sustainable recovery? What are some of the boundaries and systems that we can implement to make the prospect of achieving it much more readily? So I know through working with you through the High Performance Physician Program, you have an appreciable lens on the world of medicine, especially emergency medicine. So as you've mentioned, I do have a few questions that I would like to hear your thoughts on. Personal recovery is often a hot phrase associated with wellness, as you know, but can you demystify what personal recovery truly is and what it means, Jason? Yeah. And it's a great question, you know, and I think the first thing that comes to mind is just the root word, personal. Um, this has to work for you. Your recovery matters to you. So it has to feel like that to you and you alone, uh, not whatever external expectations others may have. There's no one size fits all. Personal recovery is by your design, first and foremost. Now, in terms of what it means to your point, I think there are sort of fundamental traits, if you will, in terms of what good recovery practices look like. First and foremost, I think it must ensure that we have the opportunity to step aside from some of the important roles that we have in our lives that command so much of our time and attention. I think for most people on this call, physician would be one of those, if not the primary role, and probably parent and or spouse or partner as well. We need, hey, we need breaks from those roles as well. So for me, first and foremost, it would be providing us opportunities to step away from those roles and to experience other parts of ourself and our life that are important to us. I think equally, um, good personal recovery means having outlets to deal with 
you know, the day-to-day -day stressors and pressures that come not only in terms of what you do in your vocation, but life in general. Life is not easy. Um, and when you add everything else that's on your plates, it becomes increasingly more difficult to do. So having outlets in terms of social connections and or more formal avenues, you know, people that we can talk to and de-stress and share some of life's challenges, but also outlets in terms of activities that we can engage in that are restorative by their very nature. And again, allow us to just immerse our time and energy into other parts of life that are precious to us. And then the other thing I would say about personal recovery that maybe doesn't get as much uh, you know, newsworthy attention, to me, it's about anchoring our personal recovery behaviors and habits to systems. If we can anchor them to systems, we have a chance of sustaining personal recovery, even at times such as this, where you know, it can feel a little bit more daunting to do so. Um, and if we have systems in place, as I say to you, we can ensure that we're getting personal recovery every single day in big and small ways. Two weeks in Mexico once a year is not enough by my estimation, especially if we're rolling into that completely fried and, and frazzled to the max. So, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of value in, in squeezing in small pockets of recovery daily to ensure that we are taking care of the machine as best that we can. And then the final thing I'll make a comment about, you know, what it is and means, to me, it's as much about beliefs as it is the actual personal recovery behaviors that we might engage in. Um, I like to tell people that we perform at the level of our belief, not just our skills and experiences. Um, and I think a lot of people who have struggled to find meaningful recovery, probably that's manifested in some doubts in our ability to do so. And so if we're trying to engage in recovery activities, but we have beliefs that are working against us, it can be a challenge. So that, that's the first few things that come to my mind in terms of, as you say, demystifying what it is. That's wonderful. You know, one of the things that the stress of the pandemic has taught me was exactly like what you said, Jason, to find an outlet to process my daily life stressors. As you know, having three kids in five years, I was perpetually tired all the time. And that was my excuse. But being able to find my passion for running again during the pandemic was a small step in terms of my proactive um, endeavor to steal back my personal recovery. So thank you for that. So then for those of us working in emergency medicine, what are some of the barriers to personal recovery? Sure, besides the pandemic, we could just end there, but no, uh, I think in general, I think a lot of people that I talk to, it's the obvious things, you know, we feel as though we are up against it in terms of available time, in terms of available energy, we are often task saturated and overextended. And, and you mentioned yourself being a mom of three boys and having a husband that you also love to spend time with and making time for yourself to, to do running and other things, et cetera. That's a lot, you know, so being able to, to balance that all becomes important. We have many competing roles and responsibilities that we have to respect and honor. So to me, those are the bigger surface level barriers, if you will. And if we look at those things and we feel as though our prospects for personal recovery are on the other side of those things changing, mm -hmm. finding more time, finding more energy, having less tasks and having less responsibilities, it can feel really frustrating, right? And exhausting. It can make us feel at times like there's nothing I can do. And that's the part to me that becomes really lethal. Because if we feel as though there's nothing I can do, we end up doing nothing usually. Or we start to try to embed personal recovery habits, but there's just so much resistance already going into it, our efforts oftentimes will fall short. So those are the main barriers at the surface level. Um, but I would like to encourage, encourage us to consider some deeper barriers um, that to me need to be addressed first and foremost if we have a chance to shift our perception on those other surface level barriers. Uh, the deeper barriers to me include things such as, ironically, as we've just been talking about, the, the limiting beliefs that we may have currently about our possibilities to produce better recovery. Mm -hmm. If I believe I can't do it, I'm not going to do it. And I'll shut down any efforts to try, or again, I'll, I'll probably fall short because the motivation may not be as strong as the resistance. So working through those beliefs becomes important. I think a lot of people I work with um, in your field, struggle at times to set sufficient boundaries in their life. Um, and I think systems to put in place such that the consistency aspect of recovery can be something that we meet regularly. 
And related to that, I think we have unrealistic expectations at times. I mean, and that's not to say we can't get everything done, but at what cost? You know, a lot of us are taking on extra stuff that is important, it is urgent, um, but it's getting in the way of other urgent and important things. Mm -hmm. And then the final one, if you will, is as a result of those things, our nervous systems mm -hmm. are just completely overworked and under recovered. And so if you think about what it's like to be constantly feeling stressed and exhausted, and then someone saying, hey, but make sure that you find time to recover and do all these extra things. It just seems so daunting. It just seems like one more thing that I'm going to struggle to be able to do. So if we can identify and work on these deeper barriers, gosh, chow, there is life and recovery to be reclaimed there. Uh, and I think that's where we have to start to find a better way forward to address those deeper barriers first. So then how would you change the narrative around recovery possibilities then? You know, there's a guy by the name of Peter Crone whose work I really like, and he likes to say, he challenges the people he works with to say, okay, well, do we have a problem or do we have a story? Because there's a big difference between the two. So the first thing I wanna ask people is, well, what's the story regarding personal recovery that's keeping you stuck? And it's the obvious things, you know, what do you mean? Didn't you hear the part about I have no time and no energy and too many responsibilities and, and there's nothing I can do? And I say, listen, I can entirely appreciate how it feels that way for you right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of truth to what we're saying there. But our question here is, is it the ultimate truth? Is there anything else that we can shine a light on and point to aside from how it feels right now? We step back and say, is there something we can do differently? So I get people to challenge that narrative and ask ourselves, is what I'm saying about these prospects absolutely true? Or is there some partial truths, perhaps some untruths? Is my perception being colored by the state that I'm in, stressed, tired, exhausted? Is it being colored by past experiences where I've tried to instill better recovery and fallen short? And if the answer to any of that is yes, then we might just have a story that we can begin to shape and shift in a way that allows us to reduce some of the resistance at the very least to attempt to ensure better recovery. I like to say to people, all the stories we tell ourselves are true, except for the ones that are not, which is a lot of them. And especially when we're under constant stress and strain as, as I'm sure many of you are right now. So as long as we identify with those narratives, they will be true. But if we can poke some holes in them, wow, there might be some freedom there too allow us to step in to recovery efforts with a greater sense of purpose and a greater sense of, of being able to stick through with it. So the first step to me would be to audit these stories. Is there a better story here that we can anchor to? It's hard to improve our well-being or recovery if we're convinced that we can't. Right. So quite necessarily then, we've got to provide a different set of cues and instructions and beliefs about what is possible to our mind to give us a chance to create a different response or outcome. So revisit that narrative and ask yourself, you know, the, the story that currently exists around my ability to produce better recovery, is there more a more befitting story, if you will, if I altered or adjusted some of my beliefs mm -hmm. and put in place some boundaries and systems that would support my efforts? I'll answer for you. Yes. <laughs> yes, there is. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it's so insightful. I completely agree with you that it's mind over matter, for sure. I find that for many of us, although we may recognize uh, some of our own barriers to personal recovery, we often are faced with not really knowing where to start. And I know that's yeah. my biggest issue. So what suggestions then do you have on how to build recovery into one's day? Yeah. Especially well, for an eMERGE doc. Absolutely. So step one, if there were steps, it's not exactly linear, but again, let's focus first on the narratives part and get that working for us, or at least less against us. Number two, I mentioned the importance of boundaries. I don't know many people who can manage it all without having effective boundaries in their life. Uh, we need to put boundaries in place to protect our emotional and mental energy at the best of times. And I realize boundaries are uncomfortable, but they're necessary. Uh, the great author Brene Brown likes to say that setting boundaries for yourself is choosing temporary discomfort instead of long-term resentment. Oof, that's a powerful statement. Let that one sink there for a second. Boundaries show us that it's possible to be fully there for all the important roles and responsibilities that we have in life. 
And what's interesting is the research around boundaries. If you look at it, you go, what does a lack of boundaries look like? It looks like this, neglected self-care, constantly feeling overwhelmed and overextended, starting to feel you know, burgeoning resentment towards some of the roles and responsibilities we have and starting to feel a burgeoning sense of wanting to avoid some of the tasks and responsibilities that we have. That sounds like a lot of the conversations that I have day-to-day -day basis with people in your field. Mm -hmm. So we have to appreciate that boundaries are absolutely essential if we wanna have a chance at sustainable recovery. Another thing I would tie into this, uh, my mentor, someone you know very well, Dr. Cal Bodrum, he used to sh uh, show a slide and it, was, it showed that the characteristics of someone who is the susceptible personality for burnout. If you look at that list, it reads as someone who has no boundaries. Those individuals struggle knowing how or when to say no. They're very quick to put their own needs aside in, in, in lieu of the team or other people. Uh, they're people pleasers by their nature at times. They uh, adopt sort of the Superman hero syndrome. I can do it all. I can take on it all. Sure, I can do that extra thing. That speaks to me as someone who lacks boundaries in their life. So we need to make sure that we're mindful of that. And not just mindful, we have to, the rubber has to hit the road. So what kinds of boundaries and what's important? Well, it's not just boundaries for saying no to things. That's important. Um, to me, it's boundaries for how we treat ourselves and how we talk to ourselves and the stories that we allow, you know, to, to be how we see and view our possibilities, both professionally and personally, what have you. We need boundaries maybe for the way that others treat us. And then certainly, yes, we need boundaries in terms of what we take on and what we consume. And the consume part is not just literal consumption, but, you know, at the end of a long day, when you've faced all the challenges at work, you know, maybe Twitter is not the best place for me right away, you know? So maybe I need to be more mindful to protect myself in certain situations. So that becomes really important. And then the second piece is to where to start. You know, child, I'm a big believer in systems. Mm -hmm. um, if we try and instill habits that are not anchored to systems, especially when you have so many things on each of yours as respective plates, odds are we're, they're gonna fall off eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great book out called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he says, you know, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We sink to the level of our systems. So if we want to instill some sort of a, a behavioral change to produce better recovery, it has to be anchored to a system that allows us to consistently engage in it. And I'll illustrate with a quick example. There was a physician I spoke to recently who wanted to become fitter. You know, that they had, you know, COVID had been wreaked a little bit of habit on their personal activity levels and they wanted to get better. And they came to me and they said, you know, and, and nothing's working. I even went to a trainer and they gave me an exercise routine and they gave me a nutrition routine and, and I lasted two days and, and it didn't work. So I guess I'm just not someone who can do this. And I said, wait a sec, you know, well, what, what else needed to be put in place to have a chance? And when would the optimal time for you to recover do, in this case, do exercise? And they said, well, in the perfect world, I do it right after work, right before supper. But the problem is, I'm the person who's responsible in my family for preparing supper. So you see that this wasn't about that the person didn't know what to do because the, the information as to how to train wasn't the solution. The solution we had to work through this person's barriers and set some boundaries and say, well, what is the solution? What could we do if that's the main barrier, cooking dinner? What could we do creatively to alleviate that? Because otherwise you try to add a thing on your plate that was already overflowing Mm -hmm. and nothing else gave. So they, they looked into having meal prep three days a week, which gave them the time and energy to participate in the activity. That's what I mean by anchoring it to a system, putting systems in place, recognizing what we want to create, what is the resistance probably within myself and others around me that people don't like our boundaries. What is the plan and what supports do I need to make it work? When we embed recovery in that way, we have a chance to be consistent with it. So those would be my top tips. Um, the final thing I'll just say very quickly is, you know, I've had a chance to be around a lot of physicians, as you alluded to, and the ones that I would deem most sustainable, they're not special in any kind of way. You know, they don't have magical tips and tricks, but they do precisely what we're saying here, and they do it consistently. They set themselves up for success by recognizing, I have to believe in the processes that I'm Im implementing here, I have to have boundaries and systems in place to support those efforts. And when I do, 
more as possible. So that would be my uh, suggestions for people trying to create more recovery, even in these challenging times. It's so meaningful. And I actually laughed to myself when you were reciting the list of people who lack boundaries. Out of the criteria you just listed, I think I hit all of them. So I have a <laughs> lot of work to do. <laughs> I'm working on more healthier boundaries. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and your pearls of wisdom on personal recovery. You have been an invaluable resource for sustainable performance and wellness in the field of emergency medicine. Every time we talk, buddy, I pick up new pearls. So I hope that my colleagues who are tuning in can walk away with some strategies that will help them to engage in more meaningful experiences. So thank you very much. And thanks everyone for listening in. Thanks, Joe.